Well, maybe not. We'll just see. Just emotionally inside. Michael Kroger, Senator James Patterson, both join us now to talk about this and a whole lot more. Michael, this is, this is the sleight of hand trick. Every person in the Canberra Press Gallery knows that there is a tax increase on 10 million people up to $1,500. Yet every person in the Canberra Press Gallery is pretending that they've found an extra $500 for 5 million people under the... This is literally give with one hand, take away with the other. Mate, he's Houdini and Stephen Bradbury all at once, uh, <laughs> this Jim Chalmers. Um, you know, he's been hit in the backside by the biggest rainbow of all time. He's, he's dramatically increased pers increasing personal income taxes. Look for the take on personal income taxes, by the way, on <laughs> Tuesday night. It'll be a record. Wages have gone up, therefore taxes have gone up. Um, and he's in the middle of a massive, you know, increase in revenues because of the mining boom and the revenues from the mining boom, the industry that Labor would like to close down, by the way. And he's going he's to miraculously produce a small surplus this year, which which will disappear next year. So, um, yeah, this is a sleight of hand trick. And uh, let's hope the media, you know, <laughs> point yeah. out the fact that with the low, in, low and middle income tax offset disappearing, whatever he's going to give them is, in fact, not compensating for that, mate. I think we all know there's only going to be one person doing that. It'll be little old me, and we'll do it uh, loudly uh, before, during and after the budget. But also, on top of all of this uh, as, as well, Senator, you've got this scenario here where let's imagine that they're able to hit a surplus of a billion dollars. Congratulations. Well done to everyone. Didn't they just announce a tax of $1.1 billion on tobacco last week? Hmm. So again, if they're giving you anything less than $1,500 they're taking from you, if the surplus is anything under $1.1 billion, it's based off a tax that they're introducing and only announced last week. Yet, you can feel the vibe. They desperately want to keep the new car smell about the government. They want to put a gold star on them and desperately... Old mates like Peter Harcher want to say, forget about National Defence of the Liberal Party. It's all about Labor now. They've got them on National Defence. They've got them on the economy. They've got them on the voice. They've got them on the Republic. Shut up shop and goodbye Liberal Party. Paul, if the government is able to deliver a surplus budget this week, it will be built on the backs of hardworking Australians who are dealing with the worst cost of living crisis in decades. Mm. And exactly as Michael Kroger said, it will be on the back of increased income tax receipts from people whose wages have gone up, not because their standard of living is increasing, not because they can afford to buy more than they could last year, but because inflation has pushed them into a higher tax bracket while their real wages, the things they can actually buy themselves, are going back. Backwards. And of course, this government has done nothing at all so far to combat that inflation crisis that we're facing. In fact, they've been so economically irresponsible with their increased spending that the RBA has to go further and faster with increased interest rates to try and combat it. So that's the real test for the government this week. What plan will they have to reduce that inflation crisis that's hurting Australian households? Well, and also, another little trick that's going to be here is remember they turned around and had sort of a show budget, a fake budget in uh, October. Now, there were a few little things that got changed between May of last year, October of last year, and it is some of the predictions in and around wages, so that when they eventually got to where they were in May, it wouldn't look like the big jump that it actually has been. Instead, it's going to be uh, going back to the six months, go back to the 12 months and double-check where things are there. Again, we're eagle-eyed on it. We've seen too many of these things. I love when journalists pretend that reading a federal budget's like, oh, it's somehow like, like decoding a secret message from an Enigma machine, <laughs> or it's like going and doing your year Year 12 exams. And hey, it's pretty simple. You can go into some pretty easy areas and they're the bits that they can't, well, they can lie about in prediction, but they can't hide from in reality. And that's what's about to happen here. But watch the gold stars being handed out by the people who want to play politics as opposed to actually tell you the truth. 10 million people going up by 1,500 bucks. You're any uh, worse off than uh, any better than 1,500? Well, then we can have a chat. But most people are going to end up well and truly not. Surprise, surprise. All right, by the way, um, we're going to spend $11 billion on topping up the wages of people who work in aged care. Now, Michael, there's not a person amongst us who doesn't say people who work in aged care definitely need more money. But this is a really interesting change. I can't think of other industries, and if there are, please tell me, where the federal government tops up what the private industry already pays someone to work for them. 
Well, it does that in the childcare sector, and I should declare, as I always do, I have an interest, a financial interest in the childcare sector. Fair enough. Uh, it does it in the childcare sector through the um, through the concessions it provides to the rebates it provides to childcare operators for to subsidise parental uh, contributions. And mate, you know, do we think they should get a pay rise? Of course. I mean, my mother was in an aged care home for a few years before she passed away, and the care she had was just magnificent, and the people were wonderful to her. Of course you want, you know, people who do that wonderful care work to get a pay rise, but I read that there's going to be an increase in 10,000 people and they're going to be attracted to the aged care sector to work because of the pay rise. Mm. Where are they coming from? Mm. <laughs> like, yeah. They're coming from the childcare sector. They're coming from the hospital sector. They're coming from other sectors. So this is what happens when you get, you know, this is, this is pattern bargaining, you know, in, an, in another form. So there's now going to have an increase in wages in the other care sectors because people will go to, of course, naturally where there are higher wages uh, and $10,000, $7,000 for cooks, etc. These are great wage increases. So it's going to take people from other sectors. Uh, that's the problem when you have, when you have a one-off increase in a sector where other people are doing similar jobs in other sectors and getting less pay, mate. But also, don't forget, this is baked in, that obviously it's not just a one-off pay rise. This is about the money that will then be there forever, presumably. Again, Senator, when people hear things like this, do they actually understand? And obviously the government does. They're, they're deliberately making the decision. But do people think this is a one-off $11 billion or do they understand that mm. this is now baked in? This is every year. And anyone who wants to take it away uh, will turn around and be, oh, those evil insert party are trying to cut the wages of nurses. Instead, they've just added $11 billion of spending on top of everything else every year forever. Every year. Paul, that's a very important point because while you're right, no Australian begrudges an increase in pay for aged care workers. Let's think about the other decisions this government has made in the last year to increase spending. They're not just increasing spending on aged care, they're increasing spending on childcare, on healthcare, on welfare, on the NDIS. In fact, the only minister who's gone to the Expenditure Review Committee to ask for more money who came back with nothing is the Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister Richard Miles, who can't get a dollar for defence. But everyone else, every other constituency of the Labor Party that's gone to ask for more money has been told yep absolutely here you go and that is unsustainable we've got a treasurer and a finance minister out there talking about how we've got a, a, a major problem with our budget that it's it's unsustainable in the long term well they're making it worse they're adding to that pressure and that adds to the pressure of cost of living that families are facing it drives inflation up and it means that the reserve bank has to keep increasing those interest rates which is really hurting mortgage holders and renters more and more and more because this government's shown no fiscal discipline whatsoever so if we do have a budget surplus, I predict it's going to be a very brief one and it's going to be a sea of red after that. Well, which means the actual decisions taken by government, again, is the idea that rather than being, you know, uh, struck on the backside by lightning or winning lotto for one year, that means, great, you know, how good is it? The structural decisions of government, if they can't keep that going, it means they're spending more than they're making and their plan for making is, hopefully, to keep the minerals going while simultaneously trying to deny uh, new things like two coal mines in <laughs> Queensland. That would, of course, turn... Like, follow the logic. But, again, very few people in the press gallery, because they're cheering this team on, see what the long-term logic of any of this stuff is. Now, James, I'm pretty sure you mm. won't be able to have an opinion on this matter because, as a ongoing uh, serving parliamentarian of the Liberal Party in Victoria, there may be consequences. Michael, I don't know even if a member you're allowed to talk about it, but I will try with you. So, more redeeming. I didn't have a problem with her turning up at the meeting. People are freely able to turn up to, to public events. <laughs> then there was the whole thing about this sort of, you know, trumped up sort of little Napoleon leader that wanted to, to boot her from the party. Couldn't get enough votes, so therefore they never really put it to anything. She signs a thing and she's out for a few months. Then there was a ridiculous uh, suggestion from her, apparently, at the end of last week. She might sue the party, and because she is threatening to sue the party, that is now the new reason why they want to try to boot her from the party coming up on Friday. I note that she has now turned around and reversed that particular position, which means the only person who is smiling, the only one who is winning, is Daniel Andrews. Because every day you're talking about mm. this, you're not talking about him, but... Dear God, Michael, what is going on? Now, I'm saying all of them. I'm saying all of them here. A leader who clearly can't get what he wants, which means he'll use any excuse to go after a backbencher. A backbencher who, yep, got a bit, got screwed over, but let's be honest, you know, there's a certain sandwich that you have to eat in the first couple of years of Parliament and sometimes they don't taste amazing. What is going on? 
So the first thing I'd say, mate, is that, you know, let's not get too carried away about these issues. These are inside the Beltway issues. I mean, how many people out there know that Daniel Andrews effectively sacked 18 state members before the last state election? Basically yep. nobody, because the only people that pay attention to these things were people within within the party, right? The media ramble on about it, we ramble on about it, yeah, but to most people it's of no interest whatsoever. So... Look, these, after you have an election defeat, you are obviously going to go through a period of soul-searching, as a party should. Now, um, John Pesuto has been elected the leader. He's a very bright person. He's a very good person. Uh, I know him incredibly well. I worked with him closely when I was president a few years ago. I admire him greatly. This has been a very difficult issue. Uh, and uh, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it to the members of the parliamentary party to, to work out. But... Um, you know they've got a leader, and uh, he he deserves he deserves support. And I think if people have got complaints, they they take them to the leader, and they take them to the leadership group. And this sort of consultation by press release and mm. press leak is 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 not helpful. But. Uh, I'll leave it to the members to work out, which I'm sure they will on Friday. Fair enough. And, Senator, I will not waste my time asking for a uh, no-committal co no answer, so I'll move to the something far more significant here, which is, yet again, as the Shadow Home Affairs Minister, you've been getting some huge wins here. First, we saw those cameras that have all been ripped out everywhere. There's the TikTok stuff as well. And now we learn that, again, some of the drones being used by uh, the federal government, well, they are all currently being uh, put in a pile and not being used because the technology is Chinese, which means potentially, theoretically, there's a way the information they're gathering goes back to China. First things first, congratulations. Thanks, Paul. You know about the audit I launched on the Hikvision cameras. You know about the audit I launched on the policies about TikTok. Well, the other audit that I've launched was into the DJI drones being used across the Commonwealth in March this year. And the reason why I launched that audit is because DJI Drones, although a popular commercial drone manufacturer, it is also a company which is blacklisted by the Pentagon because they believe it's secretly controlled by the People's Liberation Army and it is sanctioned by the US government because they believe they're involved in the repression of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And so it's clearly not an appropriate product to be used in any Commonwealth departments and agencies. Well, already before that audit is even complete and only halfway through, the Australian Defence Force have admitted that they have these drones, that they were using these drones but they have grounded these drones and they are investigating whether or not they'll continue to use them or not. So that is a big win and important progress because there are alternatives out there. The US military is able to operate a very sophisticated drone operation without using DGI drones. I'm pretty sure the ADF can find it within their capability as well to find drones that are not manufactured by a company which is close ties to the China's Communist Party and which represents a serious cyber security threat and risk to our defence forces. I couldn't agree with every word, more than every word you've just said, but there is a but that has to be followed up here. 30 second version so I can get the bold predictions and we'll go to London. Um, the procurement of these things may well have happened in the past 10 years. If that's the case, then obviously we know what the civilian leadership was. Um, how are you able to get more effective insight into the system from outside of government than you were seemingly able to get from inside government? What does that say about when you're the government, this isn't a Liberal Labor thing, but when you are the government, you don't upset the gapple card? Paul, I think the question to ask is where was the James Patterson from the Labor Party in opposition asking these questions when we're in government? That's what opposition senators do. We submit questions on notice through the Senate to the Sending government to find out answers to, to these questions, maybe embarrass them um, and maybe get some action and some change. If, we could, if I can do it in less than a year, well, then the Labor Party had nine years to do it. Where were they? Fair point. All right, bold prediction, legally binding. Michael Kroger, what's definitely happening this week, apart from a whole lot of crap in Canberra? Well, my prediction, mate, is that the ABC board will do nothing about the really disappointing coverage on the ABC last night of the coronation when we had to sit through, or those that watched it, uh, I certainly didn't, had to sit through um, a really tiresome and inappropriate revisitation of the evils of colonialism and what happened 200 years ago. Um, uh, that was not appropriate. Uh, there is another time and place for that. But uh, I think the ABC has to move on in the same way, mate, that, um, you know, my father was captured by the Germans uh, just north of Tobruk, just before the siege. Um, and he was in an Italian prisoner of war camp for two years. I, 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 it's not the same. It's not yeah, the no, same. No, I understand what you're saying. But I don't hold, I don't hold current day Germans, Italians or Japanese at fault for what their governments did 80 years ago.
Yeah, it was like this sort of alternative commentary. Like in America, you can listen to a radio station that, that has your footy team's call or the opposition's footy team's call. And this uh, this felt, again, like some sort of otherworldly stuff. But alas, it is uh, the way mm. they go and you can complain your way under the coverage, apparently. And then everything was all right. All right, Senator, quickly for you, a mm. bold prediction for the week ahead. Two very quick ones. One, Tony Burke, inspired by Penny Morden, is going to walk into the chamber on Tuesday with a sword, hoping to replicate uh, her viral social media sensation. And two, watch this space on the drones. There's more to come. Uh, believe it or not, they're elsewhere in the Federal Public Service. Oh, good man. Thank you. One and all do appreciate it. We'll talk again very soon. All right, a bit more on the coronation, including live to London with people who uh, well and truly know Charles very well. We'll go from the most serious, most reverential,